Hello and welcome to uh, today's talk on language or introductory introduction to language as part of my series on introductory psychology. Uh, today we're going to do a very brief introduction uh, to some of the basics of uh, the psychology of language, talk about uh, language itself, uh, how the brain accomplishes language, and uh, a few other basic topics. So we'll first talk about language and communication from rules to meaning. We'll talk about the complex structure of human language, talk about language development, then its relationship with cognitive development, and then finally finish up with language in the brain. So let's start with basic language um, properties. So language is any system for communicating with others using signals that are combined according to rules of grammar and to contain meaning. So there are, of course, a myriad number of different kinds of languages. There are spoken languages, there are written languages, there are spoken and written languages, and of course, gestural languages like American Sign Language. Human language is more complex, involves words uh, representing intangible things, and is used to think and conceptualize, which is different from other animal species. We know animals can communicate, uh, but have a uh, little evidence of developed language in the same way that we think of language. Uh, one of the major components of language is its grammatical structure. Uh, all language have sets of rules that specify how the units of language can be combined to produce meaningful messages. Most of us learn grammar implicitly. That is, we, while we are taught the sort of formal rules of grammar, we also know what a, a proper sentence sounds like or a proper sentence does not sound like. So we know ways in which we can combine words and phrases to create meaningful language, uh, which are an inherent part of how language works. So human language is pretty complicated. There are approximately 4,000 human languages. Again, all have basic structures of sounds and rules. Not all languages have the same sounds or types of sounds, which is why oftentimes learning a new language can be difficult because we have to learn how to create new sounds that we're not used to creating. The smallest unit of sound that is recognizable as speech is what we call a phoneme. Uh, so this is an identifiable unit of speech that is recognized as that rather than random noise. Now, of course, English phonemes are different from phonemes from other languages. So what, while we can recognize English phonemes even in other languages, we don't recognize them in uh, languages that have different phonemes, that is, phonemes that English does not have. Phonological rules are sets of rules that indicate how these phonemes can be then combined uh, to produce speech sounds and words. So those phonological rules indicate how phonemes are combined to produce, produce specific uh, speech sounds. So if you look at this uh, from a structural uh, perspective, we have uh, words, or what are often called morphemes, which are uh, created by phonemes. So for the, it's th and uh. uh. There are three phonemes in boy, but oi. <laughs> so the boy hit the ball uh, consists of numerous phonemes which become words. Those words then become phrases, the boy and hit the ball. And then that final thing is combined together to the boy hit the ball. So this is the basic way in which we understand language, produce language, and comprehend language. Morphemes are the smallest meaningful units of language. We have morphological rules. These are a set of rules that indicate how morphemes, morphemes sorry, can be combined to form words. So there are very specific ways in which morphemes can and can't be combined to form words. Syntactical rules then are sets of rules that indicate how words can be combined to form phrases and sentences. So every language, of course, has different syntactical rules in, uh, and specific orders in the ways in which we create sentences. So these syntax rules uh, indicate how we can combine words and phrases to make meaningful sentences. We also talk a lot about deep structure versus surface structure of language. Deep structure is the meaning of a sentence, so what meaning it is that we're trying to convey with a sentence. Whereas the surface structure is simply how a sentence is worded, so it's form phonemes and morphemes uh, are combined together uh, to create uh, the surface structure, uh, which conveys the deep structure, which is the meaning. So if we think about uh, how these syntactical rules work, we have uh, noun phrases and verb phrases. We have determiners, nouns, verbs, and noun phrases. All of these sort of combine with adjectives and etc. 
So there are uh, three characteristics of language development as we start to learn how language develops. Children learn language at an astonishing rate, we know that. Uh, the human brain is essentially primed to learn language. Uh, children tend to make few errors while learning how to speak. Uh, and uh, their passive mastery develops faster than their active mastery. That is, they develop a pretty good sense of how language works simply by listening to others speak it. Uh, infants can actually distinguish between all human phon phonemes when they're born. Uh, this ability starts to dissipate by six months of age. That is, we distinguish phonemes uh, for those languages which are being spoken around us. Essentially what happens is uh, our neural network starts to develop and we start focusing on those phonemes uh, which we hear every day and those that we um, don't hear uh, are simply no longer uh, distinguishable. Uh, what's interesting is uh, infants learn and kids learn to comprehend language uh, before they're able to actually produce language. So they understand Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, understand what's being said uh, before they're able to actually produce language itself. So, uh, all infants sort of go through the same sort of babbling sequence, where they're starting to form uh, phonemic types of sounds that will eventually get put together into morphemes and sentences and etc. So there's an orderly progression of language development, um, and there seems to be several things that it might depend on, basic general cognitive development and experience with a specific language. So cognitive and language development go hand in hand, and oftentimes uh, as one uh, developmental timeline is advanced, so is the other. So for example, girls are often uh, ahead of boys in uh, some cognitive aspects because their language develops much sooner, um, and so there are some uh, clear relationships between language acquisition and cognitive development. So if you examine English language acquisition by internationally adopted preschool children, they show the same progression as infants, uh, which argues that development is, this development is experience driven. Um, and so uh, there's nothing inherent about a specific language, but rather that it is uh, experience based. As the brain starts to mature, we get specialization of specific neurological structures um, that are responsible for different types of language. Uh, the earliest areas to be identified are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Uh, Broca's area is in the left frontal cortex and is responsible for language production. Uh, Wernicke's area is in the left temporal cortex and is involved in language comprehension. So if we take a look at where these are, Broca's area, as you can see, is right there in the um, left frontal lobe. Again, this is for most people. Uh, people who are left-handed oftentimes have bilateral language uh, abilities. That is, their language centers are in both the left and right centers of their brain. Um, but for people who are right-handed, they are predominantly located in the left hemisphere. Uh, so Broca's area uh, and Wernicke's area are very important for both language comprehension and production. One of the things that can occur is uh, in difficulty in producing or comprehending language, and these are called aphasias. And these are relatively common. Uh, the left communicating artery uh, can oftentimes uh, experience or be an area for uh, obstructive stroke or other type of uh, cerebral vascular incident. And so strokes um, and other uh, types of cerebral vascular incidents can cause blockage to these areas. And so aphasia is a very common uh, symptom of these kinds of incidences. So Broca's aphasia occurs when there is some sort of difficulty in language production, indicating damage to Broca's area. Wernicke's aphasia is a difficulty in language comprehension. You can also get what's called conduction aphasia, um, which is uh, no problem producing language on its own, no problem uh, comprehending language on its own, but an inability to sort of repeat what someone says. So Wernicke's uh, area cannot communicate with Broca's area, so you can't repeat something back to someone, so that would be called a conduction aphasia. So what that indicates to us is that each of these components of language has its own neurological structure. There are other types of um, language disruptions that can occur. Alexia is uh, what we call word blindness, and this is due to disruptions in connections from the visual system to the language centers. This is almost blockage of the left posterior cerebral, ar bleh, cerebral artery. Um, so people with alexia can understand spoken language perfectly fine, but cannot see words. 
Uh, agraphia is a sudden loss of the ability to write words. Now, the interesting part about these is they are, uh, can be dissociated. That is, there are patients who have alexia, but not agraphia. So the very bizarre part of that is they can write, but they cannot read what they have just written. Uh, so it's really remarkable uh, that you can get that kind of uh, dissociation. So that is uh, our brief introduction to language. Our next uh, topic is going to be on uh, concepts and categories.